thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I'm Stefan, Stefan Sam, organizer of the Schuller User Group Munich. And today we have Gail Forge with us, calling in from the USA. And yeah, so from France, originally he's working since a while at the MIT in the USA and working as a research scientist. And I'm very, very curious for today's topic because yeah, getting more into our huge political problems which we face today, I'm I'm really loving to to get more details into yeah the science part about around climate and related packages. And Gail, you you are kind of the perfect man to answer questions around this, as you are the key developer of those ecosystems in the Julia, in the Julia Bay. So thank you for being our speaker today. And yeah, the stage is yours. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Sam, for inviting me and and um, uh, and for everybody to be here. Uh, hopefully, I will do justice to this very nice introduction. <laughs> Um, let me start by sharing my slides. So thanks for, for having me. Um, so I, um, uh, what I'm going to present today is um, a combination of, of um, a couple of different presentations. Um, I wanted to cover um, some of the topics that I thought you, you all would be interested in. Um, so the title here is Ocean Robots and Satellites Observing Climate Change. And that's sort of the application range um, uh, where I'm, I'm using Julia um, for my research. So we're going to get to the specifics of ocean robots and, and satellite data as I go in the second and the third part, really. Um, the way I've organized this uh, presentation is I'm going to just give you a brief introduction of myself, and then I'm going to go in three different uh, sections, um, which I'll speak to in a second. We keep track of time, it's 12.40. Um, so my name is Gail Forge. I'm a, I'm work at MIT as a research scientist in the Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Science Department. I listed here uh, my website uh, where you will find the links to the other two. Uh, so my GitHub profile is where you will find a lot of uh, what I do with Julia. And then my scholar profile is, which is not spelled this way, uh, but the link is valid in the slides that I will give you. Um, that's my, you know, the history of my, my scientific research. So I study oceans and climate, um, both on the physics mostly uh, and the biology more recently. I do a lot of work that involves um, combining models and data. Uh, so in the sense of, um, you know, data simulation, as we often call it, or machine learning, AI, and so on. Um, I have uh, long history also of numerical modeling in this context. Uh, so ocean modeling um, on HPC uh, supercomputers and, and, and through cloud computing platforms. And as I've already mentioned, I do a lot of work on data uh, that have been combined with models. And the data often are from satellites. Um, so services like ESA and NASA, um, uh, you know, providing a lot of the inputs to my research, uh, but also field ocean data, so data that's collected at sea. Um, and I will speak today about you know how uh, the frameworks that we have to access and, and simulate these sort of data sets. My history with Julia sort of starts in 2016, uh, kind of end of 2016. I got more serious in 2018 when I went to my first JuliaCon, which was the 1.0 release also. Um, the stability of, of Julia that Julia acquired at that point in time for me was a big deal. So I moved to uh, to stopping development in my previous analysis language, which was MATLAB. Um, and I still um, I still use Fortran for some of the HPC, but I'm also transitioning to, that, to Julia for that. Since 2020, I've started uh, organizing uh, the community a little bit. Uh, so in leading the effort with Julia Climate and Julia Ocean, which are two organizations that you will find on GitHub. Um, and I'm going to be speaking about in the first part of this talk. Uh, but also topical workshops, um, like the one that will be discussed in the second part of the talk. Um, this was on Julia for Earth Observation, uh, which happened in, in January this year. 
Um, over the COVID years, I decided to um, to prioritize software development a little bit. Um, made sense for me, and so I did a, a lot of package development during that time period. And most recently, so this year and past year, I'm, I'm focusing on um, engagement with um, some of my collaborators in uh, in academia, so NASA and ESA, for example, um, but also um, working on education applications. Um, there is a little blog post that you might have seen from a lot of people um, sort of celebrating their tenures with Julia, or at least their experience with Julia in the context of hit. Uh, crossing that path, uh, that, that, that mark. Uh, so I, I have my little entry there if you want to take a look at it. And then um, you can also meet me if you are at JuliaCon this year. I will have two presentations that uh, overlap with what I'm presenting today. So that's uh, about just my introduction to what I do, who I am. Um, now I'm going to tell you about uh, three topics. Um, so I've sort of roughly divided the presentation in, in 15 minute segments. Uh, originally, I was going to do more of an interactive um, presentation, but I, I changed my mind uh, based on the amount of material I have. Uh, but you will find links to various notebooks um, in, the, in the slides, and I can always uh, refer to you, you to them later. So I'll start by talking about uh, Julia Clement and Julia Ocean, um, which are two GitHub organizations that aggregate a lot of the community work um, on these topics. Then I will specifically talk about this workshop that happened um, in January where we brought together um, a large cross section of the community dealing with Earth observation uh, together. And finally, I will tell you about the Ocean Robots project um, that I'm um, that I'm pushing forward. All right. So Julia Clement and Julia Ocean. Let's start with that. Here is a snapshot of what you will find on the uh, landing page of Julia Clement uh, today. Um, and as you see, there is a list of, um, of packages uh, that are listed there, and you see a bunch of contributors on the, on the right. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively small, but not so small uh, community. Maybe we have 30 people in, in the, um, that are members to the organization. It is meant in my mind to be a kind of a, um, an open, open to all uh, framework. So if you're interested in contributing, um, you're more than welcome. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out either to me or you can open um, an issue on the on any of the repositories on GitHub. Um, here I have a list of sort of the main packages and see if you look at what the descriptions are. Um, they typically deal with um, array types or data types. Uh, but there's also some simulation tools in there, um, specifically um, individual displacements, which is um, one of the packages that I'm leading the development of. You will also see there, for example, things like stack.jl. Uh, so that's a, um, a framework for accessing data sets and searching for them um, based on the uh, special temporal asset catalog. Uh, CDS API is a slightly older um, approach to uh, using the climate data source from Copernicus, which you may be familiar with since you're in Europe. Um, GeoRegions is uh, one of the places where there are connections between Geo Climate, uh, sorry, Julia Climate and Julia Geo, in fact. So this is about um, delineating polygons, uh, regions by polygons, uh, which is something that um, is an important task in geospatial data analysis. Um, and some of the others have to do with, you know, how you handle files, um, like NetCDF is a format, for example, that is common in my community. Um, so we have some somewhat specific um, tools for files sometimes. And at the top, I should also highlight uh, what I'm going to show you next is the notebooks uh, folder. So. One of the ways that uh, I've been trying to um, 
to demonstrate the scope of what's going on in Julia Clamet is with uh, this web page, which um, you have the link at the bottom. Um, so juliaclamet.github.io slash notebooks. Um, the, there is a GitHub repository of the same name. And this has um, this repository has, in my mind, two main purposes. One is to build, well, three, sorry. One is to build um, a collection of notebooks, like the name might suggest. Um, but two, it's also to, in one web page, um, cross-reference uh, to a lot of the notebooks that might be in different um, repositories. And so this web page has notebooks related to data, models, grids, files, and it has a bit of user direction. And the third um, major goal of this uh, repository is to provide a Docker image that you can use to run the notebooks. And so this is what is shown here. Um, so if you are not familiar with Docker, this is a, uh, a platform for containerizing uh, various applications. And for example, you can build um, a, Jupyter, a Jupyter Hub instance in there, which is what I did here. So you're looking at the way that um, the process will unfold. It will open a, um, a Jupyter lab, in this case, interface in your web browser, and then you'll be able to use the notebooks. Um, the Docker command is at the bottom. And so this is a place where if you have uh, notebooks that you would like to be advertised in the context of um, Julia Clement, uh, we, can, we can certainly do that. Um, and this is where I would suggest to try some of the notebooks that we have. Um, a lot of the notebooks that I do myself are in the Pluto framework. Um, I'm not going to go extensively telling you about Pluto. I'm assuming that you're aware of it since you are involved with Julia. Um, it's an alternative to uh, the Jupyter notebook interface, uh, which happens to be um, so the Pluto interface is, is, is a reactive framework, which is a big difference. Um, and I really like it for communication and, and, and science. So this is what is in Julia Ocean for the most part, uh, a community, a bunch of uh, repositories that um, play with one another or uh, cover certain segments of, of um, the applications, um, as well as this web page and Docker build that I, uh, Docker image that I mentioned. Julia Ocean um, is a slightly smaller community, uh, partly because um, oceanography is not an, as extensive a field as climate science. It's a component of, of climate. Um, when I created Julia Ocean along with Julia Clement. The idea for me was um, I know that the ocean part is going to get big enough that it should have its own organization. Um, so the aspects that are more specifically ocean related, I tend to put in Julia Ocean. And the tools that I develop and that are kind of cross cutting and more generalized, general than, um, than ocean applications. I typically put in Julia Clement. Here I'm listing um, for Julia Ocean the packages that we have, and I think there's a couple of uh, links here that are broken. The Argo data, I have moved to a different organization now. Um, but anyway, so we have, I think, three main developers in, in Julia Ocean as of now, and we do things that have to do with um, looking at um, biochemistry in the ocean, but also the ocean physics. So the first two, for example, are about biochemistry, ibex and plankton individuals. Um, they differ in the way that ibex is from a kind of a gridded modeling perspective, whereas plankton individuals is the agent-based model. Uh, so it, it, it follows um, plankton individuals in a, in a kind of a Lagrangian fashion. Um, using particle tracking. 
And then ocean state estimation is a package that leverages results from, um, from the community. So this is something that um, uses data sets more than it, it's a simulation framework. Um, and then as, as you go down the list, we have various topics that we are um, working on uh, collectively with collaborators in Julia Ocean or beyond. And at the bottom of the list, which is what you will find on the main page of Julia Ocean today, you will uh, also have links to some workshops that um, we have uh, we have done in the past. So the first one was um, in 2020 um, at the so-called Julia Ocean, uh, sorry, Ocean Science meeting uh, in in San Diego. Um, this was really oceanography related, uh, and the other two as well, but with more focus on on marine ecosystems. The second one we gave at JuliaCon as a workshop. So a lot of resources for you to look at if you're interested in these sort of things. Um, here I'm going to link to one specific notebook that you can that you can um, that you can look at, and that is not only available in the form of a notebook, but also as a Argus story map. Um, so this is the snapshot from that page. This is a NASA website, uh, as you see at the top left, because this is a research that I do in collaboration with folks at uh, NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in Pasadena. And so this is one of the instances where you know we are making inroads in bringing um, Julia to organizations like NASA. I think this is sort of where we are today, um, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about these sort of things in a, in a second, in the second part. Uh, but so if you go to this URL, you will find explanations on how to run the notebooks, a lot of what I've just told you about in terms of uh, using Pluto and, and Docker. Should be discussed there as well. And um, I think this is that for the first part. Uh, so maybe I'll take a quick break here and ask if there are questions or um, comments. Is everybody still online? Mm, no questions in the chat so far. OK, OK, good. Well, good to know that um, at the end of the connection. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so this was sort of an overview of um, of Julia Ocean and Julia Climate. Um, so if you are interested in contributing or using uh, the software that you will find there, you know we are you are more than welcome. Uh, do not hesitate to, um, to you know open issues if there is something that's missing, unclear, or you know broken, or etc. A lot of us are also on Slack, so on the Julia, on the Julia Slack, uh, you can you can find the, find us um, if you want to talk about this. So the next part is going to be about the uh, Julia for Earth Observation Workshop in twenty thirty in twenty twenty three. Amy, let me ask also the one question from for the first part. So if I would summarize. Um, what a user could expect from the notebooks. It's really like um, a specific deep dive into one research field around ocean and climate. Is it like that? Um, to some degree, yes. Um, let me see if I can show you the page. Um, so there's going to be things in there that really have to do with data sets. And so this one, for example, is you know how to access um, climate model output. Um, this is more about plotting. So they have sort of different um, different goals. They are to a large degree related to the, the modeling and the analysis that I do. So indeed, you can think of it as deep dive. So this would be you know a bunch of the ocean data sets, the ocean robots uh, data sets. I'm going to tell you about later. Um, this is about running a bunch of different models, um, which might be Julia code or might be something else, uh, like Fortran model or something in, in C or in, in Python. Um, then, you know, if you go down, uh, you have things that um, talk more about, tell you more about file formats. So this is sort of less, less 
domain specific. Uh, this part here, um, it relates to the file formats that are used in this community. So, you know, if you've never heard of NetCDF or um, XAR or XArray or GeoTIFF or GeoJSON, chip files, those kind of things, this might be too specific for you. Uh, but this is, in my mind, fairly general. And then it has, you know, some 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 explanations at the end. Um, so it's domain specific, by and large. Yeah. Thank you very much for the overview. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right. Unless there is another question, I will jump into part two. All right. I'm going then. So. Let me go back to this slide. So this is the workshop that um, happened in, in January, and there was a lot of developers um, at this workshop from uh, the Julia Clement um, side of things, but also people that are connected to the Julia Geo organization and the Mackey organization um, for plotting. Um, and I'll start by, you know, giving you the the link to the website workshop, the sorry, the workshop website, uh, which is on the left. Um, and this um, QR code is the same. So this is an event that was organized at the uh, mostly by the Air Center, so the Atlantic International Research Center, which is based off of um, the Azores. Um, so we brought the community of people there and the workshop was a one week event. Um, it had um, originally we had it designed. So my co-organizers for this workshop were the people listed in in, in pink. Um, and we had originally targeted uh, a somewhat small event with uh, mostly developers, but then it kind of grew into a, something a little bigger than we thought. And now we are we're looking to, um, uh, to do this uh, next year and, and maybe annually. Uh, afterwards. Um, so this was, as I said, a five-day workshop. Took place, it took place in January between the 9th and the 13th in Tercera Azores. We had 28 sessions, and each one of the sessions um, contributed notebooks, which are on the, in the GitHub repository. Um, as we went from um, a developers meeting to a you know, more general audience meeting, uh, we expanded on um, sort of the basics of Julia and the visualization component and things like that. Uh, the list of topics uh, that I have, have here will be reflected in the coming slides. Uh, so we, we talked about, you know, geospatial data analysis, uh, remote sensing, which means satellite data, in situ observations, which means kind of field ocean data, and then uh, topics of numerical modeling, data science in general, machine learning, AI, big data, and cloud computing. We had uh, 20 speakers um, and um, 40 people in the room, uh, plus um, a few uh, a fair amount of, of um, remote participants uh, via the Zoom calls. Everything is on GitHub and on, on, um, on YouTube. We're still working on uh, improving the contents. Um, we are going to present an overview of this at JuliaCon in, in July. Uh, so by then, we will have consolidated some of the content that I'm going to describe. Uh, this is the crowd we had, and the place was not bad, as you see from the picture. Um, it's a really, really interesting community, I find. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples of what we did and the sort of topics and applications we are concerned with in this context. And then um, I will present um, more broadly the notebook collection um, that we have, um, that, the, uh, that the, the, the speakers contributed. So here is a um, concrete example of, of what um, what we want to do in Julia uh, in, in the context of our observations. 
On the left hand side, you see um, a set of regions. Um, so you see the continents in white. And then if you are familiar with oceanography a little bit, you might recognize uh, the ones that are in color, uh, but most likely you won't. So I'm going to tell you these are uh, regions of the ocean that have been delineated by experts uh, to represent different marine ecosystems. Uh, so the same way that on land you might have forest and you might have desert and you might have different uh, different ecosystems. Um, in the ocean, that's the case also. And these are some of the regions that we care about. So here the notebook was just about, you know, you'd get those polygon definitions of regions and then you need to transform them into uh, these shaded areas. Um, so that's a process that, uh, from what I understand, is often called uh, rasterization, to go from a polygon format to an image format. And then the next step with that is to start doing statistics over those regions. So this is the sort of things we were uh, looking at doing, and there's a list of packages here called shapefiles, shapefiles, sorry, rasters, uh, that's for the format. Uh, then plots was used in this case, um, although Mackie was preferred uh, in general to the conference. And then, you know, Pluto AI and Dataverse. So Dataverse is um, something I created, which is um, an interface to uh, a data repository. So from this, we can get automatically the, the data from the archive, and then, you know, everything happens on the fly in this Pluto notebook to get to the kind of images you see on the left. There's one question in the chat, a, a tiny one, but in the image on to the left, um, it's apparent that all the continents are white, mm -hmm. but Greenland and Upper Island, they, they are also colored in blue. Is this just by accident or is there a reason behind it? It's a good question. I don't really know. It looks to me like it would be an accident. Um, could be an issue with the plotting, honestly. Uh, but I don't really know. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, Greenland, Greenland should be treated as land, that's for sure. Um, all right. Um, so on the right hand side, um, is something slightly different, but also related. You see contours there, and these are now the contours of the ocean topography. So the, the places where there's a bunching up of contours typically are the islands. So this is the regions of the Azores, and so we were one, on one of those. Um, and underneath you see color. Uh, so the color shading is satellite data that represents regional contrast in sea level. And that is an important quantity from the perspective of ocean currents, uh, for reasons I'm not going to go into. But so in this notebook, for example, the goal was we wanted to get data from the satellite data archive. I think this is from either Copernicus or from the uh, NASA Earth data platform. Uh, so we had both demonstrated um, during the workshop. Um, and so get data from there, create a little animation that includes both the data uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an animated sense and, and those contours on top. Um, so, you know, fairly simple um, common tasks um, were part of what we were trying to get to in this workshop to demonstrate that, in fact, um, the Julia ecosystem of, of packages um, is uh, fully mature in terms of being able to do these sort of things. And as I'm expecting that um, this collective demonstration that we did at the workshop will, um, will help uh, in, in building the community further. Here is uh, another example, slightly more advanced. So this was um, one of the topics that we, we spent some time on during the workshop that is related to the science that we do. Um, this was classification of Earth image of observations. Uh, so essentially images 
that have different wavelengths, and then you can train a classifier on that. Uh, here is an example with uh, using a, a random forest classification um, on this um, this data set that has been provided to the community by uh, some colleagues called Marida. Uh, and that is sort of a, a training set for this sort of application. So here you see uh, the results. I think on the bottom left is the um, is the rendering, I think in JPEG, oh, that's a TIFF file, uh, of the data seen by the satellite. And then on the right hand side, the different colors correspond to the um, the, class, the, the classes that have been identified and mapped out um, by the random forest algorithm. So we did this one, and then we did a related one, uh, which was looking at a, a slightly bigger data set, um, which came out of um, another group. So this is now 27,000 um, images from uh, from satellite, Sentinel-2, uh, which is a great. Let me, uh, uh, a little interruption. Um, and the and the last example, you yeah. also classified um, the plastic. Um, do, do you now just, I'm, I'm curious, which, which color on the right image corresponds to the floating plastic debris? So class one. Uh, not on top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not sure that. Yeah, the, the the classifying of plastic debris, I would expect something not to be so widespread. That's why I'm saying I don't think it's it's one of the classes that you see. Okay. I think the blue is going to have to be maybe number two, um, the microalgae. I think the orange that you see coming out of the river, um, if you sort of pay close attention, um, that has to do with marine sediment, uh, with sediment. So that would be number five, I think. I'm not sure what the green is, um, to be to be clear. I, I um, but I, I was not going to, I, I would not expect that, you know, any one of the colors that jump beside you right now is in fact the microplastics. Okay, yeah, thank you. No, no, thank, thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, I will talk a little more about the um, the marine meter problem later on from a different perspective. Um, but it is definitely, you know, marine pollution is um, is something we are very concerned with, as well as climate change and global warming. And and I think you know, Earth observations are a very powerful tool. Uh, to get after some of those things. Um, and one of the reasons we picked this topic was it also maps into the kind of um, you know AI work that a lot of people are doing these days. Uh, so we thought it was a good one. Um, so this one was um, essentially using a different data set, a different method instead of the um, the random forest this was a, using a convolutional neural network. Um, and um, yeah, so in this case, looking at you know land cover uh, rather than the ocean, um, it was interesting to us to have the two the two the two fields, the ocean folks and the land folks um, sort of interact in this workshop. I think it was a, for me it was very interesting to to see how much there is parallels and at the same time differences in how we do things and talk about things. Um, so this one emphasized rasters, gel, and that's for the handling of the data. And then flux gel, that's for the convolutional neural network. Um, if you are in the Julia world, you probably have heard of flux for that. And so these are two examples that the Whole collection of notebooks um, has a lot more to it uh, if you want to dig into uh, the, the, the small set. So I'm going to give you, show you on the screen at least, um, I don't think I'm going to read everyone, uh, what we did 
more broadly speaking. Um, so we started with uh, Julia for beginners, which uh, um, like the the name the names in yellow are, are the speakers um, and the people that really did the work. So the the credit goes to them very much so. Um, so we we you know we started with um, a Julia for beginners session because it seemed kind of obvious, and then we also had towards the beginning uh, a session by Simon Danish and and then also. Uh, about visualization, so that's the second block. Um, Martin Vischer was there to also um, represent with others the Julia Geo community, he gave us a great overview of that. Um, and then what's else in there? So geospatial statistics. Um, SAR, that's a kind of data set, uh, it stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, um, so it's a, it's a measurement technique from satellite. And there was a there was a, uh, a cluster of, of people really interested in this, um, so we we did a few sessions on that. So this was the beginning Monday Tuesday sessions. Um, on Wednesday, uh, partly because um, you know, I was one of the co-organizers, we went deeper into the ocean side, and this was also a time for some of our sponsors to uh, to shine and 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 uh, this involved a lot of ocean biology. So I've already shown you one of the notebooks from this, uh, which I think is the one, uh, well, I guess the, well, the notebook pictures I've shown you are from this. Um, on day four, Thursday, uh, we went towards several topics that have more to do with numerical co computation. So the, the first one is that here is what I was referring to a minute ago. Uh, the use of um, essentially the differential equations um, software that we have in Julia uh, from the DFQ SciML organizations uh, mostly and using them through um, packages that are dedicated to uh, ocean and climate um, to do simulations of pathways of um, things into the ocean. So, for example, plastics, um, uh, the marine meter problem, as you might know, um, we release it from a lot from the land and the rivers, and then it goes into the ocean, it propagates everywhere, and it tends to aggregate in specific regions. Um, the reasons are known, they have to do with ocean currents. And so that's one of the things we did there in this first session. Um, and then with Alexander Barth, who's in, in Liège, um, we went. Uh, more generally after uh, applications of Julia to oceanography. The afternoon, we spent more time on, most of the time on uh, data science and big data um, slash AI problems. Uh, so the, the last two, again, go back to certain type of data and tasks. And the last day, uh, we talked about uh, data cubes, which is a technology to look at high dimensional uh, graded data sets in a way that's uh, convenient and efficient and, and can even be entertaining. Um, and um, one more on the how to access data sets. So this retrieving satellite and analysis data from EO servers, um, I think was really, uh, really interesting and useful. And then the last bullet here at the end is something I'm going to show you uh, in a video if I succeed to do that. Um, so this was you know, the reason for bringing uh, developers of these Julia packages to, uh, was to stimulate um, more collaboration and more innovation. Um, as we went for, in the end, something that had more of a, a a Julia beginners and, and, and community building aspect. Maybe there was a little less than that than we expected, but this is one thing that came out and that I'm very excited about. Um, so some of the folks, oops, let me go back uh, at this one, fly this one. Um, this is something that kind of happened during the workshop um, where folks worked on you know, this capability that uh, you've experienced with things like Google Earth to navigate your like, large data sets. Um, 
in an interactive way. Uh, so this is done with the uh, Maki package and, and the Tyler.jl uh, package that was created in this context. And so what you're looking at is just me zooming in and out of a big high resolution, I should say, um, map of a certain ocean variable. And so I'll just pause briefly. This was uh, based on a model simulation that ran on a supercomputer at NASA. And they generated um, about, I think, 10 petabytes of data. Here I'm just looking at one slice um, and looking at the gradients of temperature uh, in the ocean. And so as you as you might expect, once you say, you know, 10 petabytes of data, you know, you should think, well, how do I access that? How do I explore it? How do I visualize it? It becomes, you know, a big deal when, when you have very large data sets. And so I think we've demonstrated, first of all, that we can handle this kind of output and data sets uh, in Julia, um, which, you know, is not a small thing. Uh, but then on top of this, we now have methods like the one I'm um, illustrating you um, to like explore them and you know go all the way down to the smaller scale of this data set to look at you know what happens in this little patch of the ocean and then zoom back out um, and then you know explore and have this sort of scientific inquiry um, on the fly. And so I thought this was this was really useful um, outcome of the workshop. I'm going to show you another one. These are um, videos that are on the Julia Ocean or Julia Kamet YouTube channels. Um, let me show this one. If yeah, so this is similarly another one that I did uh, a little before. This is not interactive, uh, but this I think demonstrates nicely the power of of the Mackie um, uh, set of packages and 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 and, and, and tools. Um, again to access a high resolution model output. Uh, so now this is again the my little temperature contrast. So yellow means that there is a, a little front of temperature. And as you can see from this map, which is centered, this one is on Hawaii right now. Um, there is a lot of small scales involved. And this is true over the entire planet. So that's why we need very big data sets. Uh, that have a high resolution in space and time to be able to speak to the processes that matter to climate change. And this particular video, you know, rotates over the Earth um, and just creates a little. I just created a little movie with Mackie, um, you know, that as a as a as a as a scientific communication device, but also as a way to illustrate. I think that we have very powerful graphics software in Julia, which I for a lot of people is a, is one of the main things they want to do with analysis software and make plots. Um, a question. This yeah. this power is really something Makey is especially good at or so the standard plots package would fall short for such big data sets to be visualized. Or what is your experience? That that would be my experience, but at the same time um, I have moved on from the plots package to Mackie in a way that's um, almost 100%. And uh, so I'm I'm not necessarily the best person to talk about the plots package. I think uh, plots GL, as as you know, um, as backends, um, many of them are very good, and some of them might be very good for this too. Um, I, I really like the GR backend as a side note. Uh, I think it's very, very nice. And that's the default. Um, I don't know how it would perform for doing exactly what I'm doing here, but one of the, the aspects that I would highlight from Mackie GR is uh, the way that creating animations um, is very, very easy. Um, essentially, you write a loop where you call a your function, and that's that's all there is to it. Um, in this case, what I was doing for the animation is just changing the. I've actually plotted the field in 3D on the sphere, and all I was doing is changing the angles. 
um, and then iterating on that and you know nothing else needs to be reploaded. Um, so it's quite efficient in that way. Does that answer it? Yeah, thanks for the details. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, Maki gel is, a, I would say, is a very worth, uh, you know, investing some time to learn it. It's, it, had, it has now a very good documentation also. Um, so it, it's easier than it was, and it's very powerful. And then the, the developer community around it, I think is also a great plus. So like this, um, this previous example I was giving um, is like fresh off the price, right? They're, they're, they are um, they are really pushing the envelope and, and being at the at the cutting edge uh, on many on many aspects. I think so. I think it's um, you know it's a real strength of the Julia world to have Mikey. Um And since I'm you know advertising other people's work. And that I really like, uh, I would also highlight Pluto, uh, which I think is uh, is a tremendous tool. So this is a the notebook interface that I was telling you about um, before. Pluto is not something I would use to create movies, right? These I tend to do more in the terminal window, just with making. But for providing an interactive experience and letting people explore. Um, you know, explore data sets and, and, and communicate on them. I think Pluto is a, is a really, really good asset. Um, so not to, you know, not to discard uh, Jupyter, which I think is a great notebook platform also, um, and has advantages, um, I'm a big fan of Pluto and Mackie. Both of which I, fully are agree. I fully agree. Uh, one further question for the Mackie side. Yeah. Um, because these um, images you're showing, they look really um, highly complex. Um, I'm wondering whether you are also relying on accelerations, like using graphical processor units, GPUs, or whether this can be run kind of on a normal <laughs> CPU, laptop CPU. OK. Um, I'm, I you might be talking about the graphics or the making of the movie or or the making of the actual simulation so i'll try to answer both everything to do with this this movie i did myself on my laptop after you know just using my standard cpu in fact uh, with output that i downloaded from from a computer as well uh, now the simulation that led to this we're talking about very big models. And so they are, the answer is we can do that on CPUs and we can do that on GPUs. On CPUs, the way that they have been done historically is by going to a supercomputer that has this kind of limitless amount of, of computers, of, of, of cores on it. Uh, so the model run for this, uh, which is a coupled ocean atmosphere simulations at a resolution of four kilometers globally uh, that probably took a few months to run and maybe on like the order of tens of thousands of cores Whoa. so that's the that's the hpc side of the of the of the story and that's kind of where the community is by and large um, today uh, so using large clusters of cpus nowadays though they are complementary efforts, and one of them is led by our colleagues in the Klima uh, program and the MIT side of it, especially, uh, where they have a, you know, still slightly simplified version of the same model, which originally was called the MIT General Circulation Model. Now they have a, uh, a good subset of that code and the numerics behind it in Julia. That is the ocean and against the gel package. And that runs on both CPUs and GPUs. And most recently, I think they've managed to have ocean and against run on multiple GPUs. Um, and so now you can do this sort of simulation of, of, of you know, instead of doing, doing tens of thousands of CPU cores, maybe you're talking about tens do three other of many less tens of, C of GPU uh, nodes. 
yeah, it's very cool stuff. Uh, the transition to the GPU is happening, and I think you know the group that's doing that. Um, you know, they they are they are not quite um, competitive in the sense of you know all of the history and the tuning and the engineering that it takes to get um, a state of the art model simulation done or climate simulation done. But they are headed in, the, in this direction, and I think you know within a few years we might might see some um, you know, some major inroads um, done by the Julia community in this direction. So using GPUs to do climate simulation. Thank you for the insights. Both are quite interesting. So I, I really love that the simulations or the pictures can be generated on my laptop as well. So that's that's good to to connect to, and yeah, and it's also very interesting to hear that the transitioning to GPUs is especially powered by using Julia, and something which yeah just happens right now. Yeah, no, it sounds cool. Uh, there's you know I should say there are competing efforts in other languages, you know, C plus plus being one. Um, but as you may guess, I'm I'm fully on board with with going the Julia route. Um, all right, uh, thanks for the question. Let me go back to my slides if I... How are you doing that? Uh, oh, let me just close my slides. Let's go. Okay, just bear with me one second. Uh, to, oh, there we go. So you should be back to my slide that says Google Maps for us in Julia. Yes. And, yeah, beautiful. And so that was kind of, I think, my last one on this. Um, on the Julia AO workshop, uh, as this was one of the things that I think came out of it. Um, so to close on the Julia for us observation workshop, um, we have a, a lot of um, contents uh, that were generated by this workshop uh, in the form of notebooks and videos. We are still in the process of curating them. Um, there will be a talk at JuliaCon. Um, this year on this, where we will have a, a, a somewhat more bullish presentation and, and, and we'll report on this. We are considering uh, turning the notebook collection into a book, uh, but that's you know, maybe more than we can afford to do right now. Um, and then we are planning to do something similar, a priori the same week, sort of the first working week of January um, in 2024. Plans are in progress. We expect to have updates on that by Julia. All right, part three. So part three, here I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit on what I'm doing and what I'm arguing, what I'm, some of my science goals. Now, it's also a preview of um, the talk that I will give by myself at JuliaCon uh, this summer, which has the same title, uh, Digital Twins for Ocean Robots. And so I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. Um, depending on your background, you may be familiar with this concept of digital twins. Um, I'm not going to spend that much time on it, but essentially we're talking about having a, a real system that may be a car, in our case, that's the climate system and, and the observations of it. Uh, and then a computer representation on that. So in the case of the car, there will be a, you know, a, a computer representation of simulation of what the car looks like and behaves. In my case, that is you know, simulating climate and simulating observations in a virtual world. And having the two together is what call, people call digital twins. So the pairing of this kind of real world system and with a virtual numerical one that lets you interact with the real system and, and back and forth. So in this start part, I'm going to tell you about the real system and the simulation of it. What do I mean by ocean robots? Um, here are two examples on the left. You know, broadly speaking, this may be a space robot. <laughs> Uh, observing the ocean, uh, but that's a, one of the satellites that we use to monitor things like um, the optical properties of the ocean that we used in the classification work earlier, 
also the level of the um, the sea surface, the sea level, um, as a function of um, and over the globe, and so that's an important quantity for physics for ocean currents. On the right hand side, you have a lot of dots, um, and each one of those dots is um, one point that was observed by some kind of means in the ocean. So the straight lines are like ships going through, uh, where we stop, you know, to do measurements along the way. The things that look uh, light blue uh, are actually coming from um, 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 various species like sea lions and, and other animals that live in the ocean on which scientists have put tags. So like a little temperature thermometer on like on the head of, uh, of a sea lion, for example. Um, and that's an okay thing to do for various reasons, but you should, for example, know that you know they shed their skin every year, so it's not like they are suffering from it, sea lions. Um, and then the blue, the dark blue, which is the biggest color, the most common one, um, is from the program that is called Argo. And that is uh, what is sort of shown on the top right panels now. Um, these are little uh, buoys that we put in the ocean that will drift with the ocean currents at a certain depth and then go down to, say, 2,000 meter depth all the way back to the surface, measuring temperature and salinity and other things. And once they are at the surface, they transmit data to the satellite, and then I can get it. So it's a whole army of those. There's about three or four thousand of them at sea at any given time that give us the monitoring of um, global warming in the ocean and things like marine heat waves and things like um, you know changes in in climate in ocean circulation that might have impact on climate uh, so it's a very important measuring technology so that's what's shown on the on the top right and then the bottom row is a bunch of different sort of ocean robots that we uh, we have uh, you know the global community has deployed and, and collectively maintains and and and, and processes, processes the data. So the bottom left is, you know, this sort of ziggy pattern, um, I guess, convoluted particle track pattern, I should say, uh, that shows us a function of longitude and latitude over a square of maybe a couple hundred kilometers uh, by a couple hundred kilometers. Uh, the pathway that a little floating device took in the ocean. So you see that it's kind of complicated. Uh, and we have a, um, a lot of those instruments, again, because they give us precious information on, on what's going on in the ocean. And so, and they allow us to see below the surface of, the, of them, which is the limitation of the satellites that don't really, really see the underneath. And the bottom right are two other type of instruments. Um, one is we have a moored buoy, like a weather station in the ocean. That's that's what um, what you're looking at. And so all of this to say, we have all sorts of tools like this to observe the ocean. In fact, the atmosphere also. And how do you handle them? How do you access them? How do you use them in junior? Is the first part of what I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing in terms of simulating these data sets. So if I can make virtual components of this, then I can start comparing. So here is uh, a, should have had the link here, but um, this is the documentation of the Ocean Robots JL package, which you will find currently under my own GitHub account. Uh, should migrate uh, to Julia Ocean at some point. Um, still working on that. And you have a list of notebooks here. Each one of the uh, examples is a, is a Pluto notebook that you can you can get, and you should be able to run. It will download uh, sample data sets for you on your computer and make plots of them. So all of the pictures I just showed you essentially are in that format. So if you go to this. Um, to this uh, particular packages documentation which you're looking at, um, you're going to have 
all of the notebooks that um, would let you interact with these data sets. Uh, here is sort of just for background, the reason we're doing this, um, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm doing more, is there's a lot of ideas of how to, uh, uh, to create new type of ocean robots. And then you're looking at a picture of, of these folks that um, I got the chance to meet last year in the Azores. Uh, that's the reason for the second workshop that happened in January, happened in the Azores, in fact. These are all people that are innovating uh, and creating new solutions to monitor climate change, understand the processes, and some of them are, you know, doing edge computing in the sense of they're, they're thinking about bringing uh, real computational tools on on the ocean robots to like have them like guide themselves and study by themselves the environment. Um, all of this to say that there is a real um, growth in these sort of applications and a lot of very, very good people and very you know, innovative people doing this. Um, I'm coming in as kind of a modeler to provide them a framework to try and simulate these data sets and, and design them. So not only do we have a lot of those uh, crucial data sets today coming from ocean robots, but there is a lot more to do and it's a very interesting field of research. If you're into technology, I would, I would suggest that it's a good venue for for career. Now I want to simulate these data sets, like I said. So there's two components. Uh, there's a computation of the way that an observing platform would behave. So if you put something in the ocean that's going to drift, uh, with the ocean currents, you're going to have something like this, a set of equations um, where you have the derivative of the position X of an instrument is going to be following uh, some kind of velocity that's what's on the right hand side. And so here you, I put some acronyms, I'm sorry for that, but ECHO is a large scale ocean current data product. And then we also have models for the small scales that I've sort of shown you before. And so if you just take that equation and integrate it forward in time, um, that's going to be maybe the way that, um, you know, particle of seawater would move around in three dimensions. If you change the equation slightly, as in the one that's at the bottom, uh, you can, for example, say that ocean, like plastics in the ocean are floating materials. So they're going to move with the ocean currents more in 2D than in 3D. Um, and similarly, you can think of my buoys before they were going up and down as little submarines that have a ballasting system. So you just have to put that on the right hand side of the equation. And then you can simulate um, the trajectories and the behavior of these of this, of this ocean robots. So that is the goal and, the, and, and what this individual displacements uh, GL package does. I gave a quick presentation at Julia Con 2021, and I will tell you more of, of this uh, this year at Julia Con 2023. The second component is once you have a platform, you need sensors on it. And so here is where other packages come in. Uh, Measure SGL, which is also in Julia Clement, um, is something that takes in gridded fields and lets you interpolate on the fly. And so, for example, I can get satellite data in there and observe it with my my simulated robots. Or, you know, part of the sensors, like I said, uh, can be in the realm of uh, edge computing and like using trained AI on a um, ocean robot. And so there's all sorts of uh, components that, um, you know, again, leverage the great um, ecosystem that we have in Julia for AI and, and various uh, statistical modeling and optimal control and all of that. There is, in fact, a whole Julia Roberts organization that I, that I want to interact with more with. Um, that would be part of this. OK, so now I've told you about you know, what I'm trying to simulate, and then I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. This is um, a package that I created and presented at JulliaCon 2021, uh, which is called Climate Model GL. And so what that package does is 
it's essentially a driver, a framework to drive all sorts of models. And those models might be a simple Julia function, uh, or they can be a more extensive Julia library, but they can also be like a Fortran code that is pre that's already been compiled. And now you just want to have a simple, nice uh, way to run those through a Pluto notebook without having to like, you know, learn about to use HPC. So you can, um, through this interface, run, run, you know, a range of models that, um, uh, that would require different levels of expertise and knowledge, but with a simple uh, way to, uh, to do that and essentially interface everything into this simple way. So that lets me then run this sort of things, uh, which is my model hierarchy as of now uh, that I'm considering for my, my sense applications. So like I said, so here you have a kind of a big loop uh, in the center, and then you have two sides in this part. On the left, these are physical, um, so the, the physical system, and on the right is the biology and the biochemistry. But so the idea here is I want to be able to have a simple driver, so that's climate model GL, run something like a, a, a climate scenario emulator. So these are, um, this is a C++ um, model, in fact, that lets you run climate scenarios very quickly uh, because it's very low dimensional. Uh, so you run that on your laptop. Uh, we have different parameters for what we do about climate change. And so now you can do a whole range of, of scenarios um, of global warming. So once I have that in place, then I can put that on a more complicated ocean model. And this is what's represented by this map. Um, these are the um, these are the, the global planetary transports of heat in the ocean. That's a detail. I'm propagating the climate model emulator scenario through a three-dimensional model is what I'm saying. And then from this, I can do my simulation of the ocean robots, which is this plot um, for a case that looks, in fact, very much like the marine meter problem. So I was hinting at the fact that there's a convergence of um, this kind of um, garbage in the ocean once we sort of release it from land or from ships, unfortunately. Um, they converge into those regions that you see in the in the middle of the mid latitudes. You see kind of the lines converging. Um, and once you have that, then you can you know start with the simulated ocean robots. You can start observing a bunch of quantities. So this is from my high-res model, for example, that I want to observe along trajectories of of potential ocean robots. That's like five or six models that I've already built onto one another, right, in kind of a sequence the end of it, because then I want to talk about the biology. So here is an example of how we discretize the biology in the ocean. These are maps of what it looks like when we run this in a simulation. I'm going to skip over the details. This is the physiology of a particular little piece of um, plankton, so the, the grass of the ocean, if you like, which is going to be at the scale of a, a micron. Right, so I started from the global, and I'm at the scale of the micron. Um, and then the sort of instruments that I want to simulate are things that observe the behavior of these things at the micron scale, and that's what's represented by this final model that we put in the in the mix. So fairly complex kind of analysis that involves a lot of different models and climates model GR Fortunately, is there to make your life very simple. Uh, and allow you to build uh, on all of those things that exist. So this slide is, if you have not, uh, if I have not scared you with all of those models, I just want to give you the message that there's a lot more <laughs> available and coming. Um, so I've already talked to you about the climate models GL package, uh, the individual displacement GL package is also listed there. Um, and then, so these are sort of what I'm playing with. Uh, but then there's also a few organizations that have, you know, are pushing uh, numerical modeling for climates, and I've, I've listed some of them here. Um, so there's a lot of work in that realm, both in terms of, you know, interfacing models into Julia and developing pure Julia models. Uh, 
so the ones that are listed here, Julia Sim, Julia Dynamics, and Clima, are all efforts that really target uh, re-implementing or implementing new models in Julia proper, pure Julia. Um, and I'm I'm kind of I'm using that. Um, I'm doing some of that with with some of what's listed, but I'm also trying to you know leverage everything that came before. And that's the point of climate models here. And I think I will just leave it to that. I don't need to show you the last two plots. We've already seen them. Um, so I'll just uh, leave it to that. And if you have more questions, maybe we should use the remaining of the time for that. Thank you so much for listening. You're very much invited to, to ask your questions. I have one um, right away. So um, you mentioned Julia Sim. I'm actually... My, I, I myself have never tried it, and um, I, from <laughs> my gut guess, I'm always combining this kind of with a propriety, proprietary solution, and um, which I connect kind of to what is this CMO link, um, like Netlabs and other solutions, and yeah, I would be very much interested if if you already tried it. So what, what's your take on it, whether it's kind of um, really helping you a lot and um, yeah, it should spread this more or whether you rather stay in kind of the pure open source way. Um, yeah, I think there's also kind of a, a in conflict of interest as you're working as a research, um, yeah, in, in research. And yeah, I would be interested about your take on this. Yeah, um, I mean, I should say I have actually not tried it, uh, but I did choose to highlight it because I think it's an important component of the community. It's something that I want to try more. Um, I just haven't had quite the time. Uh, as far as the, I think the parallels that you're drawing with uh, with MATLAB's um, way of doing it, I think is right. I think it's Julia Sim is is targeting the you know, the industry applications and the proprietary um, work a little more than what I would do myself. Um, I feel that on some level, as of now, um, it's also not really catering to my needs in the way that um, it's, it's for somewhat simple or standard applications, mostly, I feel. Um, so like AI and things that are like, like very standard workflows. Um, I don't think they've done quite, um, you know, the kind of work I'm describing with um, Ocean and Against, for example. Um, that's that's more what I'm looking for today than Julia Sim. Um, and I, but I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to say too much because, I, like I said, I'm, I'm not very familiar with what they're doing. I've Followed it from a distance. Looks interesting. Um, it seemed like I didn't want to, you know, just mention the stuff I do, <laughs> and so that's why I drew the I drew in that direction. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it makes uh, makes a lot of sense for me, but especially in research. You need the hackability <laughs> to to really get into the specific parts and build them, plug them together as you need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I also myself haven't tried it, so it's, um, I still need to do that. It's kind of, a, I'm going to just come in to say, this is kind of a broad problem I have with Julia, is there's just too much stuff that I want to try. <laughs> there's so much happening. There's uh, you know, there's plenty of things I should have probably listed too. Mm -hmm. I would have one other question, but of course, uh, everyone, you're still very much invited to also place your questions if you have one. Um, I'm in general more kind of a, a tool person. I really like to have my tools. <laughs> and um, one thing I, I realized in Julia in general is that, yeah, it kind of comes from academia. So where people build a lot of specific tools and and this is awesome to have kind of specific solutions which are out of the box or relatively out of the box high performant um but then there's this point of transitioning to more stable packages 
so where you get kind of a broader community yeah it's not like for this one lab but yeah maybe a larger group of scientists and i'm i'm curious to hear what what do you think about the, the climate ecosystem or the systems where you worked on? Is this also already transitioning towards a more stable um, interface for the mass? <laughs> or, um, yeah, or is it very individual um, still? Um, yeah, I think it's a very good point. I mean, uh, I'm still transitioning to that, that mindset in a way myself. Um, but the where do I start on that? Um, I mean, what you describe is is the you know is is the is the reality that I also experience. Um, you know, I find um, things that maybe you know, maybe I'd like to have seen you know move forward and aggregate more people. And sometimes there is you know duplication of effort more than there is consolidation. Um, I think that academia is a little bit like that. Um, everybody needs to be their own you know. Their own leader, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. if I put it this way. However, um, there is also, you know, some some real, real, you know, successes. And I, um, you know, one example that comes to mind that predates Julia Clement uh, in particular is is the Julia Geo organization um, that I think has um, you know has gone beyond the. Uh, as you know, as we started doing some of the aggregation and the, and the consolidation and the community building um, around around a set of tools, um, I think the, the Mackey organization is another one that comes to my mind. Is I think they have now really reached a critical mass uh, of of people. Uh, I think the, the the tools are becoming really good. Um, they are always going to be. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's always going to be the case, but even for large projects that I find that are academic or not academic, um, there is often a situation where one or two lead developers are already like in charge of the law, and and that's a hard one to overcome. I feel um, across the board. But um, I think you know Julia has an interesting mix. Of people from coming from industry, from software development, from academia, and I think through events like JuliaCon, um, you know, hopefully the, the community will consolidate around certain practices and certain and certain tools. Um, in my mind, it's still a work in progress uh, in many ways. You know, so there are. There's, you know, there's room for more. Um, in that in that context, um, if you find you know tools within Julia Ocean, Julia Clamet, and beyond on my own GitHub that you think are you know useful starting points, um, you know I'm always looking. We're always looking for people to contribute and and suggest ideas and point out the issues. Um, so opening issues is always a very good way to, I think, lead into consolidation. Um, so that's one thing I would recommend across the board. Um, yeah, that's probably a long enough answer on that. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, also something which just belongs to to the field itself. Yeah, so you have kind of the specific labs which are building kind of really new stuff coming right from the research, and hence it's very individual, very specific. And yeah, and it's just just something which takes time, so that from the specific work, more easy to use tools or yeah, more yeah tools which are yeah also yeah yeah you you get it, <laughs> which more the mass uh, which is more targeted at the mass than the the specific lab. It just takes time, and I'm curious also that you you see that this is kind of part of the process, and we already have some tools which. Which consolidated, as in the sense of it now being used by really um, huge user base, user base, and also which are very helpful in your research in the ocean and climate field. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can, I, I, I could have prepared the list. I'm going to fail at, at making it on the spot, but I'm thinking of the data frames framework, for example. Um, that's, yeah, uh, that's really 
competitive with pandas as far as I can see it. Um, there are things like that on the, you know, in the Python world that has the experience of like 20 more years of development behind it, right? Um, that is, is hard to compete with yet, you know, in a way. Well, Julia is lagging a little behind on some things. Um, but I think, you know, all of the IO stuff, all of the graphics stuff, the notebooks, um, you know, Pluto is a, is a nice community also. Um, you mentioned, yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the all of the work of Chris Rokas with, um, with SciML, and there's another. I guess this is really a big part also, <laughs> especially if you do the simulations. Yeah. yeah. There's one question in the chat. Thank yeah. you. Um, and it's about a very specific application, and we haven't actually spoken about it. So the question is, have you or your colleagues looked at models for ocean-based carbon capture? And yeah, then there's also a little disclosure, um, but I think yeah, let's first, yeah, this, this question first. Um, so yes, um, so, so the first thing to be able to do you know, carbon capture applications is, is the simulation of the ocean robots that I was telling you about, right? Because it, it's kind of, um, it's, it's a player in that. The other, another component that you need is uh, the modeling of um, the carbon cycle and, and beyond that, uh, the marine ecosystems and, and the various uh, chemical compounds in the ocean. Um, so this is where the, um, some of the work done in Julia Ocean comes in with uh, IBEX um, is about, uh, you know, the sort of a global modeling of carbon, for example, and other components. Um, and then plankton individuals is more looking at the, the, the local um, um, modeling of it. Um, the, um, the building of a... Um, of a, of a set of, of you know a set of of, of tools or, uh, or packages for focused on climate capture itself today I don't know that it exists uh, but I think it's it's not that far down the road is what I'm trying to say and there is a lot of um, a lot of interest for this um, I'm, I'm involved with a couple of things that are on the margin of this um, on the ocean on the US side. Um, I think next week uh, in Woods Hole, which is near here, it's a big oceanography center. Uh, they have a um, um, the uh, ocean carb uh, sorry, ocean biochemistry uh, summer school uh, that's going to be focused on this. Uh, I think it's next week. Um, and then there is interest. You know, I'm also involved with something called US Cliva, which is an interagency panel. And, and there is it's also a topic uh, that's emerging, uh, both you know, climate solutions and, and carbon removal specifically. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm expecting to see more um, opportunities for the Julia community to engage uh, because it's, a, it's an emerging concept. The language is right for it. I don't think, uh, on top of my mind, I don't know of a project that is doing that in Julia right now. I hope that answered the question. So thank you very much for the details. Um, I'm I'm also looking forward to kind of have have these uh, climate applications, and maybe also some things presented at JuliaCon. I'm not sure. Might be. Could be. Uh, the two the two presentations that I'm involved with will both sort of um, you know relate to this, but not address it directly. Um, so the Julia AO session um, presentation will, will will talk about you know the satellite data sets that we that we can bring to bear to the to the problem of monitoring carbon uh, on some level, and then ocean robots will have um, this sort of you know these sort of perspectives I just described. Yeah, thank you. And also, thank you very much for the question. Really good question. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Gail, thank you very much for speaking here at Julia User Group Munich today. It's a big pleasure for me. 
thank you for all the details on all the three topics. And I, I, as you heard it yourself, I was very interested in these topics and I especially like to have you kind of presenting. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Stefan. And, and, you know, thank you collectively for being here and, and listening to me. Um, and I hope to, uh, uh, to see you soon or hear from you soon. Thank you, participants. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, it was a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.